Just checking your little light is on. Can you just ask Perfect. how long Thank ago you, 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 you started having... Oh, I think we're going to call, yeah. Oh, right. oh, no, not ages at all. <laughs> I've been writing ages. I have. I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a busy gal. <laughs> No, that's okay. No, that's okay. Um, we'll we'll do it in a way. If you've got any questions throughout, just jump no, in. No, honestly, just raise your hand. We'll just and have we'll, a chat. We'll come to it's you. Fine. Honestly, I, I like answering questions. It's nicer that way. Mm. Um, but yeah, just for the for the video, I would just um, like to introduce Erin Green, and you've published is it eleven books? Number twelve. That's number twelve. 12. Yeah, that's which number came twelve. Out this week, Thursday. So yeah, that's Fantastic. the new baby. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, you've kindly come in to chat about your books and your career and um, yeah would you mind talking a little bit about how you got started how I got started um, okay when you decided to become an author and right publishing well, journey. the reason that I love coming to libraries is because that's where I started as a little five-year-old my dad took me to the library and I was given those little cardboard I had three of them and they were emerald green and I was just explaining to Martin, I wasn't, I wasn't very happy using card number one, even though she'd put number one, because she'd written my surname around the corner and even as a five and six year old, I just thought, why would that lady do that to my name? So my name went around the corner, so I only ever used ticket number two and number three because I, I kind of felt that it was ruined by the lady. But I loved the library and I still go to that library now. And I went to that library on Thursday, on Wednesday night, and delivered, delivered my last book. Um, and they love it. They love the fact that as a five-year-old, I used to go in there, and I was just explaining to Martin, I've said to people when I'm in there, that underneath the carpet is the brown tiles that I used to tap dance on. And the librarians think that's funny, that, wow, they're still under there. And I was like, no, <laughs> I've asked. Um, so yeah, I started in libraries. I love books. To the point that I actually know the moment when I, w I just thought books were just the best thing in the world. I had to wait for ages for, to get my hands on a copy of um, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. And that the read... By Richard. Absolutely. And I was just absorbed. And the thing yeah. was, I had to wait ages because every other child in the village obviously got there before me. And I remember... I remember my turn coming, that, it, it, that the book's ready and waiting for you. So I went and collected it from the library. And I remember going to bed ever so early for the, for the rest of the month while I was reading it. And that actual moment where Lucy goes through the wardrobe for the very first time, well, I didn't know the story. No one had ruined it for me. I didn't know the story. And the actual joy, I was, I was, about, I was about nine. I was about nine. The actual joy of reading that passage where she goes through the wardrobe and, the, and the, the floorboards change to snow and the fur coats change and it goes into the Christmas trees and the lamps. Well, I was just blown away. I was just absolutely blown away. That, and that has just always, always stayed with me. So that really is, I think, wow. I went there. <laughs> I was with her going through. Um, so that was that was the beginning, really, of the, of me just adoring passages and books. And then as I got, and I've reread it so many times. I've reread it out at, at so many at so many occasions. And then the other book, which I just adore and I love, and I could have bought you six versions of this book because <laughs> I have six versions. Um, this is my lovely version <laughs> of Pride and Prejudice. But, oh, this is just my favourite book. And, and uh, people in the house, when they're browsing my bookcase, you go, how many copies have you got? And I say, I know. <laughs> they're, they're for different reasons. I've got one that I read in the, in the bath, because that's a bit of a tatty <laughs> version, in case I drop it. And the pages even have warped now because yeah. of the steam. So I, I'm, I'm respectful, you know, I've got the same book. I've got one where I've got all the little tabs down the side so I know where my quotes are and all the things that I love. I've got um, a couple in the lounge that belong to, you know, these sets that you buy. And uh, I've got a very old set that I like to sniff because <laughs> that's what book people do to books, isn't it? So, so this, is, this is my lovely version that I'm actually rereading at the moment of Pride and Prejudice. But every time, and I, I read it once a year at least, minimum, 
but this is my go-to. If, if, I'm, if, if I'm really having a bad day, if there's a bad time, it's a bad something, this is my go-to book. But I find something different all the time. And I know there's lots and lots of different views on Jane Austen and, and how she might have been and what her life was like. Oh, God, I would have loved her as my best friend. I think she's just, I think she's got a cracking sense of humour. I think the way that she writes about wit and people, that's, that's my book. I, yeah, I love Pride and Prejudice. So I was this reader, loving books. And I think all of a sudden it started to evolve. Could I do this? Could I actually write a story? I hadn't got an idea for a story, but could I actually write a story? Not as good as those. That's never going to happen. But could I write a story? And I think that little seed was there because I was such an avid reader. And so as a teenager... I was thinking it, should I, should I, could I, would I, should I? But the thing is, I lived in a working class family. I didn't have the best education. I had parents that, um, my parents don't really appreciate art. Mm. My parents, um, yes, the Mona Lisa's lovely. That's very lovely, nice, next. They don't, they, they can't look into it or they're not infused right. by it. They're not inspired by it. They don't. Me, I'm bowled over by it, but that's, that's me. So I wasn't really encouraged as a child to do arts, drawing, painting. And so this little seed in my head about writing a book, that sounded really pretentious because <laughs> yes. I just kept thinking, if I say I'm going to write a book, some people are going to think, who says you're going to have anything decent yeah. to say? So I kind of squashed it. There's sort of that working class thing of like, you're just going to sit in a room and make stuff up, are you? Yeah. It doesn't sound like a real job. Shuffle the alphabet, because that's <laughs> yeah. what I do. I yeah. mean, it, let's, let's get down to nitty gritty. I just shuffle the alphabet, don't <laughs> yeah. I, and put some punctuation in. But my, my family really weren't like that. So that teenager that thought that, it just stayed there. And it did just stay there until I got my own home. And in 1994... I moved into my, my first little house and it's a little, it was a little townhouse and I had two bedrooms and I just thought, I'm going to try. That's it. I'm going to try to do some writing. And now I live on my own. Nobody need know. <laughs> and they didn't know. They didn't know for years because um, I never told anybody. And, and you I just did it in secret and just... Complete secret writer. Really? I did it secret. In fact... I've just said 1994, <coughs> when I got a publishing contract in 2017. Oh, that's a long journey. 23 you, years yeah. as a secret writer. That's incredible that you stuck that out for that long. That's amazing. Especially like in the 90s, there wasn't the self-publishing no, scene that there is now. There where you could just submit it to Amazon and they'll post it out for you. Absolutely. I, I had to tell family that I'd yeah. been writing because they didn't know. So it was 23 <laughs> years of, of not knowing that I was doing writing. And then when I explained that I'd got a book contract for three books and the first one comes out in August, yeah, <laughs> I had to take that on board. And so that's, that's how I started back in 19, well, back as a teenager with that little nugget, that little seed, and then right the way through. 2017 when I actually got published that's incredible so perseverance 23 years of plodding yeah 23 years of an apprenticeship that's what I call it that was my apprenticeship <laughs> so did you write a lot of novels did you finish novels and then um, sort of shelve them or did you yeah start? I've got I've got about four that have been shelved right um I didn't start off to be published I started off writing purely to see if I could do it Oh, okay. Purely, so I'd write a little short story. I'd write um, a flash fiction. Though yeah. It wasn't really called flash fiction all those years ago. It was just called, you know, just a small piece. Um, and as time went on, I thought, I'm going to, I'll try a book. Right. So I started to write a book. And of course, some books you kind of, I, I now realize that you write yourself into a corner. Oh, okay. And 
actually that's because you've taken the wrong road with the book. Yeah. So you need to reverse, scrap that section and then carry on the journey. But I didn't realise that way back then. So right. I do have about four books that are in a bottom drawer. Um, but I've got to say, when I did get my very first contract, well, when the lady asked to see a full manuscript, which was this one, The Christmas Wish, that was my first book, um, she did say to me, have you, have you anything else? Have you got anything else written? And I said, oh, yes, what would you like? I've got loads. <laughs> so she said, oh, okay, um, tell me. So I told her about different books I'd written. And she, so I, I ended up with a three-book contract straight away Amazing. because I'd written that much and I'd kept that much that that was it. I just, so I didn't have something called, there's a, there's a phase called second book syndrome. Oh, right. Which so a like lot of authors, yes, like the difficult second mm. album. I didn't have that because I literally took it out the drawer and, <laughs> and handed it over. Incredible. And then I could have done that with the third book. So this was the second book. So this was already written, Single Girl's Calendar. That's about a broken heart. It's like an advent calendar for a girl with a broken heart. You open a door for each day. Yeah. And like the first day you go and have your hair done. Oh, the right. se second day you go out with the girls. Third day, you, you know. That's it, great. Yeah, so that's, a, that's an advent calendar. And then the third book is The Magic of Christmas Tree Farm. And this is a story about a young lady who works at a Christmas tree farm but actually dislikes Christmas because of the sadness that's attached to her Christmas. So Brilliant. straight away yeah. I filled my first contract because I'd been writing since 1994. So yeah, so yeah it, it paid off. Nothing's ever wasted, ever, in this game. You can always save it and then use it again if needs be. So yeah, it's happened. Brilliant. Did you end up going back and sort of taking ideas and characters from your old unpublished ones? I haven't yeah. because the actual, the actual stories that are sitting in the drawer are still feasible. They're still viable. Oh, okay. They just need rewriting right. because it was, the, it was the baby version of the, this writer that right. wrote them. So yeah. I now need to mature and move it along and, and do the right thing with it. So I need to rewrite those four. So you can do them justice. Yes. Brilliant. Yes. I'm I'm glad that they haven't been published. Because yeah. <laughs> they are <laughs> they are very they are very um baby steps towards publishing. Yeah. But I haven't I haven't um I haven't used the stories or, or the or the names because those names are attached to that story. Right. So yeah. These are characters that live in your head already. Yeah, that's Brilliant. it. That's right. Um could you talk a little bit and sort of describe what the, the vibe of your books is, what okay. kind of um, stories they are. Right. Uh, how I, do you describe them to people who've never read them? Never read them. Right. I, I write about ordinary women. I don't write about Hollywood sirens. I write about the ordinary women and men that you see in the supermarket that they're just living their life. But we each of us have an extraordinary life and an extraordinary tale to tell because we've each walked a very different path. And so I always say, when I, when I pitched to an editor, I said to her, the ingredients for my books are like, are like life. You've got love, you've got laughter, you've got life, whatever it throws at you, but you've also got loss because loss comes in lots of different ways, doesn't it? It could be a loss of identity, loss of freedom, loss of children. There's lots and lots of things, and that's, that's what my books are about. So I see it as a big mixing bowl, and that I put all the ingredients in, I put the characters in, and then we mix it and we see what happens. And that's what my books are about. And the way I write it, I have three characters. There's three main women in my books, and then their story weaves in and out, just like we weave in and out of each other's lives and you don't understand the importance that somebody might have. So you'll have a story, they have a setting and then there's three women going about their business or whatever the, the premise of the, the location is and they all affect each other, they all support each other and, and yeah, they kind of come together and affect each other. So 
That's I love that. Yeah. I really like it. I read um, New Beginnings at Rose Cottage this week. Yeah. And I love that you've got three main characters who are all at different stages in their lives mm -hmm. and they all have um, sort of not trauma as much, but, you know, they've all got something that's dragging them down in their yeah. life or that they're trying to overcome. Um, yeah. And it's, it's nice to see them kind of come together and untangle their yeah. lives a little bit. Well, the thing, very, is with, uh, the thing is with experience and knowledge... It doesn't matter what age you are, does it? it, yeah. it you know, in, in um, New Beginnings at Rose Cottage, that is a book that um, sometimes in life you find yourself in a, in a situation where you haven't got the friends to go on holiday with, have you? Or you haven't got the family to go on holiday with. And yet you know you need a holiday. But how do you take that step? How do you take that step to go on holiday on your own and trust that you're going to be safe? Because you don't, you don't know that, do you? And if you could guarantee that you are going to be safe and you're going to have a roof over your head and you are going to have company, maybe more people would go on holiday on their own. And in New Beginnings at Rose Cottage, we have three strangers, three ladies, that have each booked a room in Rose Cottage to do just that. They have no one to go on holiday with. And so they go to, they go to Brixham and they literally meet in the cottage they're each hoping that their companions will be their age well that, that isn't how life is and so we've got three women of three different stages in life come together and of course the initial thing is oh okay i'll spend the week on my own but at least i'll be safe but of course within no time the three of them have found a connection and it might be the younger lady, Benny, who teaches the older lady something, but then it's reversed and they support each other for a fortnight and work their way through the difficulties that they're reaching yeah. experience in life and they actually learn from each other. So that's, that's new beginnings at Rose Cottage. But I find that happens in all walks of life. I, I was a school teacher and the number of times I learned something from the children. Yeah was great and I used to say knowledge knowledge goes backwards and forwards and and you know it doesn't it just flows doesn't it from person to person so it doesn't matter on the age and that's what I did in New Beginnings at Rose Cottage that's uh, so yeah that's what happened. I love the way um, most books um, I haven't, haven't really read a lot of um, romantic comedy yeah. sort of books before uh, I stick to dragons and Stephen King <laughs> um, and I loved how you have the three main characters and you sort of jump between them within chapters yeah you, you're not doing the sort of mm. game of thrones thing chapter yeah. per person yeah it's much more fluid and you, yeah, you're yeah. sort of in and out quite quickly yeah um which makes them much more relatable and it sort of evens them out it makes them like um seem like they've got more in common because they're all struggling through very different things yeah but going through the same kind of emotions um, um so it's not as like you're in this person's head now, and now you're in this person's head, and yeah. you know there's no, um, it's a lot more human, um, which yeah. I like. And it's like almost like a play, isn't it? Yeah. But if if it was on stage, you would literally see one lady in the kitchen, one lady in her bedroom, and, and one lady in the lounge, and they would like just yeah. And that's that's almost how I see it in my head when I'm writing it, like a stage play. Oh right. Because then it that. It, it, I'm, I'm literally writing down the visuals of what oh, I'm okay. seeing. I'm yeah. a very visual person. And so if it was a stage play, that's how I would see the, the, the stage, that yeah. you've got different women and, and almost a spotlight going on to a woman of what's happening on the outside, but then she tells you what's happening on the inside as well. So yeah. that's how, yeah. I like that you get to see someone from the outside and then 10 seconds later you're in their head and it's completely different. Mm, yeah. Um, no, that's great that's, I feel like that's what novels do best, isn't it? They, it is, absolutely. In people's heads. And the other, the other thing that happens with my novels is somebody will, will buy a copy and then they'll read it and then they'll say, oh, I could relate to that character. Yeah. Um, could relate to Emma or, Claire or Ruth or, or Benny. And they're very different stories. And, and that's what happens. People say to me, oh, that, that, that was me. That's my story. It's yeah. quite strange, but lovely. I like that they're, um, they're just ordinary people as well. There's mm. no movie stars and no, there's no, no um, you know, I read a lot of, I, I quite like a, a, a working class book. Um, yeah. So I like train spotting, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. But they're often very grim 
people from like really horrible yeah. poverty stricken situations yeah. you rarely get books where they're sort of you know just from normal everyday life yeah. they're not going through horrendous trauma every day no. um so that was it was nice to read books about people that you know are sort of in a similar situation to yourself yeah um you know they're not starving on the streets of no Edinburgh. they're not it's um, not all hollywood red carpets yeah, and, it's, and it's shoulder always, pads kind yeah. of thing no i don't i don't write usually often either the very high end mm. with your billionaires yeah. and your warriors and yeah. your magicians or your very low end <laughs> yeah. like train spying fellas yeah, it is. um so it's nice to read something no. that's of a relatable kind of level yeah um, absolutely you know very lucky to be in that relatable kind of level obviously hey, absolutely um, but it's, people you know people go progress through life don't they and they yeah. they, they they, we've each got dreams. We've each we've each got dreams. We've each got hopes of, of what we want for the future. And I just think if you if that can come through into your everyday life, it yeah. just eases it for everybody, doesn't it? And makes some life more enjoyable. So that's what I write about. <laughs> yeah. Did you start off writing the same genre, or have you? Um, you did. Yeah. You've always yeah. wanted to write. I've I've always written. Well, if you take Pride and Prejudice. <coughs> Not that I'm putting myself in this wonderful woman's. Um, <laughs> oh, no, couldn't kiss her feet. She's fantastic. Um, but if you if you unpick this, it is about her neighbours. It is about the people that she lived amongst. It's her observations of women of her time and what happened to them, and the rules and regulations that society imposed on them. So in here, you have your love, your life, your laughter, and your loss. I haven't done anything different. I haven't changed anything. I haven't reinvented the wheel because that's exactly what I do in my books. It's exactly the same. It's about communities, about people that are living by the rules that society imposes upon them. And, and sometimes it's tough <laughs> when you live by the rules that society imposes on you. So, I, yeah, I've, I've written what I, what I feel I read. And from what I feel that Jane Austen kind of installed into me, um, this book, which is my, which, this was my debut. This is about a young lady who, she was found on a doorstep as a baby and she was right. left on a doorstep. And of course, society rushes in. So social services took her. She was placed into fostering. She was placed into adoption and she's had a lovely life. But nobody can answer that one question. Who's her parentage? And of course, things like that niggle, don't they? And they ask questions. And, and of course, every time she goes to happens anything in life and it goes wrong, she says, well, that's because, that's because I was, my, my life started as it started. It started off in the wrong way. How do you expect me to keep down a job or keep a decent man or find decent people? It's not going to happen. So in this book, um, she goes back to that doorstep because she knows for a fact her family, her parentage, was at that doorstep for a brief moment. And then she oh, unpacks right. and the villagers have been waiting for her because the villagers have often wondered what happened to the baby on the doorstep. Because, oh, right. of course, so that was my very first book. That was, but again, it's, it's writing about community, yeah. writing about ordinary women that are trying to make sense of the life that they have. So, yeah, yeah, it's all the same kind of genre. That's brilliant. I struggled to get into um, Pride and Prejudice at first because I didn't understand the, the rules. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't understand, like, my wife's a history teacher. Yeah. And she sat with me and we watched the, uh, the brilliant Colin Firth one. Yeah. Um, and she had to explain to me, like, oh, he's just introduced himself without being formally introduced That's by another it. character. He's... he's He's done a complete <laughs> error there. And, Bit of a faux pas uh, there. Yeah, and I didn't understand things like, um, you know, I thought the dad was hilarious. Yeah. Um, but she's like, mm, he is, but if he keeps on, they're going to lose everything and starve on the streets. Absolutely. Um, so he's kind of like a minor villain of the piece. Yes, he is. Um, he, he, he didn't handle things well when, when there wasn't a son. Yeah. And the knock-on effect is what the daughters are carrying. So, yeah. yeah. No. Um, so I love all those different layers <laughs> to it and, you know, the... I didn't understand. I thought it was, you know, from the outside looking in, especially as a teenager, yeah. you're like, oh, it's just a show about handsome Colin Firth 
splashing about in a pool. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I didn't understand the societal yeah. aspect to it. No. Um, and there's always something different when you read Pride and Prejudice. You pick yeah. up on little words and things. Yeah. I love that when you read a book as a teenager, it's a completely mm. different book as to when you read it as a grown-up. It is. Very um, much so. Places seem to be a big feature of your books as well. Yeah. Um, do you choose places you've been to and love, or do you sort of... Um, um, do I do when I don't. Later, I or? do when I don't, if I'm, if I'm completely honest. Um, it's something that's changed throughout my books, because I think readers are getting more involved, that they want to know where it's set. They want to enjoy the fact that... <coughs> they understand where it's set yeah so i have bought copies of my books to, I'll, I'll pinch this one um this one was a, a, as a prime example i went on holiday to brixham i've never been before ever and when i said i've got a holiday in brixham people said to me what do you mean you've never been to brixham didn't you go as a child <laughs> everybody went to brixham and i was like well i didn't i got there and the first thing that i said was how hilly is it? That was the first thing I said when I'm at those inclines like this at Brixton. I didn't know that. I'm, I'm walking into it as, you know, in my 40s. Um, so it made sense that my character gets off the bus and the first thing she thinks is, wow, that's hilly. How am I going to manage this for two weeks? Um, so Brixton, I went on holiday and... I absorb things and that's what happens to me. I absorb information, I absorb details and it was on day four that all of a sudden we were going to, um, well, we were travelling around in, in a car and uh, I was just seeing the area and it was that light bulb moment. So I quickly, and this is what authors do, I quickly got my phone out my bag and I literally put woman A, woman B, woman C because until I've got names... That is her name, woman A. So, and then I just jotted some details down. And, and I thought, right, if Benny had struggles with her weight, being at Brixham all for two weeks could be a big issue for her because she's not going to get up to the top. And, and then two minutes later, everyone's saying, she'll go down to the harbour again. And you have to go down and it's up and down, up and down. And I thought she'll struggle. And I thought, if I make Ruth woman B she's um she's a carer for her mum but she's desperate for a break as much as she loves her mum she it's it's hard and it's tough being a carer so she needs a break and then Emma I just wrote down Emma and I just thought what happens if if she's looking for love she's she's desperate to have some solace and someone in her life and and that's how it came about I literally wrote a note yeah. on my phone on day four of being there and by the end of my week I had a complete book plotted out in my head and I jotted it all down and then I came back home and this was the very first book that I signed with headline and um, I said to my I said to my agent I went down to I went down to meet her for a cup of tea and uh, she, she phoned my agent and said uh, I've just had a lovely. I've just had a lovely meeting with Erin Green, and I would like to sign her for for, for some books. And um, David said to me, "The contract's on its way, coming to you, and there's dates on your contract for when you have to hand in the book." Um, and the contract came through, and the date looked really close, really close. So I said to David, "How how long have I got to write this book? I haven't started it. I've just got the idea in my head. I've just come back off holiday." How long have I got? And he said, um, you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. Um, so I asked Siri, the bloke that lives in my phone, how many days until the 4th of January? And the answer was 109. 109 days. And I thought, well, I'm not working Christmas Day and I'm not working New Year's Day. So this book was written in 107 days. That's incredible. And I wrote it every day. From the day this contract came through, I wrote it in 107, and I did take Christmas Day off, and I did take <laughs> New Year's Day off, um, and it's quite pacey, yeah. and I think it's quite pacey because, <laughs> because, 
because there was an author with a deadline <laughs> that was literally um and I was teaching while I wrote that book so I did I did it time. yeah at the oh same time I, I was a full-time English teacher so every night I came home so yeah every every book's slightly different and you do remember the circumstances in which you wrote it so yeah this one's 107 days um from my holiday till I handed it on the 4th of January and uh and yeah, that's that's what happens. Did you um just to get into the nitty gritty of it? Did you say I've got hundred hundred odd days and I need so many words per day, or did you just power through until you got to the end? And um, I try the uh, the that method sometimes to be like, oh, I only need five hundred words a day, and then I've got a novel yeah, in six months. I've got um, I've got to be honest, and that is a quite that's quite good to think of that in order to to pace yourself. Yeah, because a month can go by, and as an author. Some authors don't write much in a month. And if yeah. you actually looked at 500 words a day, you'd be okay by the end builds of the month. Up. It okay. builds up. Yeah. It's a quick time. So there's 100,000 words in here. So I must admit, I do say to myself sometimes, it's 1,000 words a day, you know, yeah. kind of thing. So, but once you get into the flow of a story, sometimes you'll do 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Right. So you actually very quickly get ahead of yourself. But that, that's not a bad technique for someone yeah. that wants to start writing, to think about a set amount of words each day. Um, I just wrote it as quick as I could yeah. because you then have to go back through and edit and right. proofread. Yeah. Um, so I couldn't actually use the whole 107 days for writing. Course, yeah. The majority would have been writing. Um, but I do, remember, I do remember reading this literally on the 2nd of January, knowing <laughs> that I'll have to send it off in two days' time. So, um, so yeah. But you can, you, a lot of authors do that, have um, a set amount each your, day. I read on your website you're a big fan of NaNoWriMo. Yes. Which I love. Um, I, NaNoWriMo is the um, National Novel Writing Month in November. And the aim is to write 50,000 words in one month and to do that, you need to write 1667 a day. So 1,667 words every single day for 30 days. It's a big, and you do. big job. It yeah. is a big job. Um, you, you do, I mean, the first time, the first time I tried it, I failed completely. Well, yeah. I failed miserably. <laughs> I did. I think it was about day 12. Right. I wasn't prepared and I wasn't ready. And the house wasn't ready because things like dinners, um, cleaning, yeah. laundry, those kind of things get in the way. So you have to kind of prepare yourself. You have to do a big clean in October because <laughs> you might only be doing a run around with the vac late at night, yeah. 11 o'clock, while you're doing NaNoWriMo. Um, but I love it. In fact, I would actually say the majority of my books, the majority of my books, their birthday is the 1st of November. Really? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Because... It's fantastic for a first draft yeah. because at the end of the month, you've got 50,000 words. Right. And what I tend to do in December is I let it go down to a lesser gear yeah. and then I'll write another 40. Oh, okay. So in two months, you can have a 90,000 word So you're not doing two of them in a row. You're just kind of doing the one, beasting it, and then yeah. slowing down a little bit. Yeah. Finishing yeah. it off. Kind of go through my gears. That's yeah. how I, I see it. You know, oh, brilliant. Planning's like gear one. Yeah. Um, nearing the deadlines like Gear Five, right. so so yeah, um, but yeah, Nano Rimo is a fantastic way to get a, a first draft on the page, and and there's no yeah. there's no correcting. You just write, just write your story, just tell your story, and and save it, and then. But it's lovely to know. It's lovely to know at two o'clock in the morning that there's hundreds of other people around the world also tapping away because actually they need to kind of catch up where they are yeah, because they had, a, they had a, the words didn't come yesterday. So it's quite nice that, you know, you know someone else somewhere else is tapping away and, and working and writing. So, they've yeah. turned it into a great little online community, haven't they? With like, it's fantastic. They've got brilliant little pep talks and things mm -hmm. um, for if you're in a bit of a scrum. Yeah, there's a, there's a website and it's completely free. Anyone can join in. Um, and they have a junior, a junior version as well. Oh, really? They don't, they don't set the total for the juniors. Right. The juniors is very much um, every day you've written. Oh, okay. Every That's day brilliant. you've written for thirty days. Yeah. Which is which is an achievement when you're yeah. when you're a child or a teenager. Um, there's a free website. Just put into National Novel Writing Month and it comes up. Completely free, but there's thousands, thousands of people worldwide. 
doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I found it really helpful to just kind of, uh, you know, it's terrifying um, because you feel like you've just got to write, even if it's rubbish, you've just got to push through to the next bit you think might be good. Yeah. Um, and at the end, uh, it might not be brilliant, but it is at least something to go back and edit. And Absolutely. And you can see sometimes where the story doesn't need to go. Absolutely. Um, and and it's, it's a habit. Yeah. The very fact that you've gone to your laptop, computer, or, or handwritten, that would be a task and a half in <laughs> nano, but or some people do handwrite yeah. still. The fact that you've sat down every day and you've written for 30 days, that's a habit, and that's exactly how you get from being a scribbler, a secret writer scribbler, to being an author is by having a habit. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's fantastic. Love it. Yeah. Um, how do your... Um sort of look at the end of your first draft are you very I know some people are very the first I think Lee Child famously says he writes one draft hands it into his agent and he's done yeah um, and some people will go through draft after draft and say you know if anybody saw my first draft I would you know die of shame yeah um, a dirty draft as some yeah. people call it <laughs> my drafts I could hand my first draft to a reader and you could read it as a, as a, as a proper book. You could yeah. read it as a book. What I would say that my first draft is missing is some humour. Right. Um, because I'm still thinking over the funny things that I want to put in on certain scenes. So the humour isn't there. Some of the description isn't as tight as it could be. Yeah. Some of the description can be quite waffly in my first draft and I have to kind of pin it down and cut it down. And... Sometimes I do find that I've repeated a vital detail. So, oh, okay. so the book that I'm writing at the moment, I read something the other day and I thought, wow, I'd said something like, we're here for five days. We're here for five days. It's a five-day holiday. We're here for five <laughs> days. And I thought, wow, anyone doubt if we're here for six days? <laughs> you know, and that's the kind of thing that I put in. Yeah. And it's only when I'm rereading that I think, yes, I think we've got the message. Right. It's five days. <laughs> so then I take out. But you write, because you're writing every day, you do forget what you wrote four days ago yeah. and you kind of repeat it or, or think, oh, I'll add that in again, which obviously I wrote <laughs> five days too often. So, yeah. yeah. But my, my first draft, somebody could read it. Somebody could, um, yeah, somebody could read it. It's not what they call a dirty draft. It's quite clean and... And the only thing that I do, because I write three women, I don't like to confuse myself on the screen as to whose head I'm seeing the oh, world. Okay. Yeah. So I actually don't write in black font. Oh, right. I write in colour. So I, I write my manuscript. If you whiz through my screen, it looks like a scarf of three colours because I've got pink, mm. blue and green. And then I, when, I'm, when I'm typing in green, I know that I'm with... That particular lady. That's brilliant. But it, it also, it, but there's a practicality about it. I did that when I was doing that 107 days. <laughs> I suddenly thought, I can't waste any time here. So, but when I'm whizzing through the screen, if there's a short pink and a long blue, I think, oh, we can't have any more there. So I'll actually twist a scene to be seen through her eyes. Oh, okay. Because brilliant. I can't afford to give it to the lady in blue anymore. Or the lady yeah. in green, because the lady in pink, she hasn't got much to say in that scene. So I then twist it. So then when I finally flick through my screen, and they're all, you know, meaty pieces, um, it's the very last thing I do is change it to black for my editor. Oh, and right. that's how I, that's one of my, I'm done now, because <laughs> everything's gone to black. So I highlight it all and everything goes to black. Um, so, yeah, my, my three ladies... And I bring lots of things with me to show. But that's actually how I plan as well. When I, when I have an idea, I, I open a book and I, everything about my book is in here because then I can free up my head for right. creative things rather than remembering she's got green eyes and she's got brown eyes and she's got blue eyes. Yeah. So everything I write down, and especially if you're doing a series, if you get a detail wrong, it kind of ruins it for the reader if you get a detail wrong. So every, this is kind of like my working document. That's but brilliant. that's what I want. But I work on, I, I plan using post-it notes. So that's, oh, okay. woman, that's woman A, 
in, in pink. And that's her story. <laughs> that's woman B. <laughs> oh, so you do the stories for each individual person first and then you kind of interweave them. Mm. Brilliant. Or... And very difficult, I imagine. <laughs> well, no. It's really simple because if you've got a staircase in your house, that's the best planning wall ever. So I have an idea for that. <laughs> I have an idea for a book and then I get my post-it notes and I know that my post-it note, I know my ladies are going to come on stage as in pink, blue, green, pink, blue, green. So I go up the staircase and I know that I need about 90. All right. So I'll, I'll probably put up about 70 because I, I am a planner, but I don't plan all of it. I leave a little bit at the end because... While I'm over here writing this, something comes to me and then I fill in the gaps. So what I do is I, I literally spend three days on the staircase <laughs> filling in details. So if there's an argument here, over here they have to meet. So I put where they meet oh, okay. and an argument, then, then make up. And then I'll go up the staircase and slowly, slowly all my piece of paper get yeah. me. And then I get all my pinks all my blues and it goes in That's and I put brilliant. them in order but it means that when it comes to writing like nano yeah each one of these is a nano day because oh, okay. I just have to write that today amazing so I can forget about the rest of the book yeah I can forget that I need a hundred thousand words because I don't not today I just need that That's and brilliant. then and that's it I just put it in and and yeah. do and swap it things around and also if you make a mistake Lots of people as authors have these beautiful, beautiful notebooks, like, you know, really expensive and beautiful. I need something that I can scribble in and throw out because right. I make mistakes because that's, that's the kind of person I am. So I need something that that's actually quite worthless. I can just scribble whatever, get rid of it if I need to get rid of it. And it's not this beautiful book that I've ruined forever. Right. You know, yeah. it, just, it just goes. So that's what I do. So, so that's all my, all my planning. Um, so, no problem. Lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you, sweetheart. Do you think that you're, you're planning like that because you're a teacher? I feel that I was a teacher too. I feel that you're, you know, that you, you've transferred those skills a lot in, you know, the whole post it note and planning and being organised. Do you feel that or not? Or is I, that just I, not you? That's me, and I think that goes right the way back to that little five-year-old with that tiny little, the tiny little yeah. library ticket where she wrote my name round the edge, and I thought no, I you didn't plan that. You didn't. <laughs> so I think, I think, yeah. I'm going to be honest. I think I was an organizer, and I think I used my skills in school to be a teacher, and then left <laughs> teaching and and yeah. parted ways with it. I think I've always been organized. I'm, I was the kind of kid where your teddies were always lined up, that I've just always been. Oh, that's just me, do you know what I mean? And I just think that in order to speed up book writing, I've used, I've picked up different ways of doing things and used them. And yeah. that, that, I think, it, it, I know like you mentioned Colin Firth in, um, which is done yeah. in Five Pages. Do you remember when he was in the, that film Love Actually? And he yeah. was a writer. Yeah. And he had that, he had a... Um, there was a Portuguese girl who we fell in love with, yeah. and he was a writer. Yeah. He was by the, uh, he was writing by the the lake, yeah. and there was a big wind, and she was trying. To, and I sort of think of you. You're so organised yeah. like that. And he had all his how I imagine an author with massive bits of paper. Yeah. You know, there was a wind, and it yeah. and it all just sort of went. Whereas yeah. I feel you were very yeah. organised, and it's it's all kept safe. Yeah. Well, this book, I started it. I started it with, ooh, 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 where's he gone? Can't see what I'm looking for now. There. So I started with that one. So that was series, that's book one for this new series. Summer Dreams in, at the Lakeside Cottage, which is Hawkshead, uh, the, the, oh, right. the um, Lake District. And so my details went in. And you might have seen me take a little clip out because I've, dealt, I've done with those pages now. There was a little clip that I don't need to look at those because that relates to that oh, right. book and then and then i've written this one so it's the same cottage so i need to know where the arger is i need to know where the hearth is yeah. i need to know what tiles are on the floor in the kitchen so that's all in here because if i suddenly put um oh i don't know 
to some other kind of flooring in the kitchen, my, my readers know that actually yeah. you had red tiles in this book, so the red tiles have to be in that book. So that's why I have to keep the information in here. Book three, I'm nearly finished of this series. And last week I got a little bit bored. Well, oh, I won't say bored because I don't get bored. There's a lot going on in this head. I don't get bored. But last week I was so... I don't like editing, and that's what I'm doing at the moment for book, right. for the book number 13. I'm editing at the moment. And my brain just thought, I need a creative morning. I need an hour of writing. So book 14 was born last week oh, right. because I literally thought, I need an hour. Uh, I need an hour of writing a new book. And so that's also Lakeside Cottage. And so this, this actual book and notes will have produced four books in the end by the time that's it's done. Brilliant. So... Um, so yeah, that's how I do it. I Does each book stand on its own, or do you have to read them in order? Because that kind of annoys me. Because the library you might have the first one, but it never. Has to We're terrible for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. As an author, you do learn as you go along, and you and I listen. I know, and this is it. I listen to what people say, and I think, right, how can I do that differently? I also read. I read all my reviews, good or bad, good, bad or ugly. I read every review that's put online for me. And um, you know it's me because I actually, I actually press the like button underneath and lots of my reviews have just got one like button and that's me <laughs> saying thank you. Good, bad or ugly, don't mind. My very first books, my very first, they're all standalones. There's no linking, okay? There's no linking in those. Those are standalones as well. And then Headline said to me, would you do a series? And I'd always loved... I always loved looking at the Shetland Isles on the weather map. And I always used to think it was funny because they used to appear in a box on the weather map, but they don't do that anymore. And I used to think, where is that? And then when I found it was Shetland, it became, I'm going there one day. So I did. So when Headline said to me, will you write a series? I said, yeah, in Shetland. And they said, oh, nobody else is writing Shetland. Why not? So I wrote Shetland. So... Same I people, thought, same people well, same this, is, this is it, slightly different. I've had, to, I've had to change it. So I wrote from Love, from Love, from Shetland with Love. So what I did was I started it off in the same place with the same people, same characters. So in this book, you meet three ladies, and then those three ladies fade into the background and you get three new ladies come into book two. And then in book three, the book two ladies fade into the background. And then you get three new ladies for book three. Ah, so everyone's still there. So they're all still, still part, there. They're still part of the community. Yeah, they're all start, part of the community. Really? I, end, I end up with literally 16 ladies that you, you kind of meet and greet. But because with the Shetland series, you meet them as you would at a party and learn a little bit more about them, you do need to read the Shetland series in order. But when I read my reviews, people were reading book two before book one. And to me, that doesn't make sense yeah. because I don't know how they understand book two because book two builds on from book one. So when Headline said to me, will you write another series? I said, I will, but I'm not doing the same again. I'm not doing... The, you, have, you have to read it in order. Mm. So I thought, how can I, how can I write a series where that happen, doesn't happen? So that's why I went for the cottage. So it's a rental cottage. Mm. You get to know the cottage and different people run it. So in this book, we have three hens on hen dates, hen night, hen weekends, that move into the cottage and have lots of fun together. But it has those three ladies have nothing to do with this book, it's the same cottage, but because it's a different week, you have a blended family that have moved in, and it's, it doesn't matter on this series which order you read them. And that was only because that was like my pet hate that I was. Some people read. Some people are reading oh, really? book four. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't. I really couldn't do it. Some people are reading book four and, and knowing the end of my story. And then saying, oh, I've bought book one now. 
but you know the you know the end of the story how do you how have you done that i couldn't i well i couldn't my ocd wouldn't let me do it but uh, so i just thought mm, how can i change that so that they're standalones so this series they are standalones it's the cottage that's the same you get to understand that and understand all how the layout um but it's different people different family groups that are moving in to the cottage so yeah Brilliant. it sounds like you sort of sorry do you find do you feel like you put yourself into your characters you find elements of yourself in there oh, i'm in every book yeah there's no there's no yeah. doubt about it i can't hide it yeah. um people that know me really well say when i got to that page and it said i was just laughing because i know that because what you do as an author i've got a library in my head of all those experiences that I've done, and I literally just pull things, <laughs> yeah. and I put them in my in my in my big mixing bowl, and I add a lot of fiction to it. You know, I, I haven't I haven't lived these lives, but I put a lot of fiction to it. But there are certain things that are said that, like friends, will say, I even know where that came from. And I'm like, yeah. go on, tell me, and then they'll tell me, and I say, yeah. So every single one of them is me because it came from me um do i purposely put myself in there no i think it creeps in yeah. and during the editing i think oh well that's me I, 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 yeah i spot it sometimes and then sometimes i don't spot it until afterwards when it's been published and i think yes that's me there so yeah my fingerprints are all over it and and there yeah absolutely. that's quite cathartic yeah, yeah. it is because you, you kind you get of get a little bit paranoid sometimes that people might read your books and psychoanalyze you based on yeah <laughs> and they probably do good luck <laughs> good luck um some people have said to me you've got lots of churches mentioned in your books and i think ah that's right because my dad owned a company when i was a little girl that sold candles in churches oh, so nice. going into churches as a child that was second nature to me because my dad was delivering candles to the churches and quite a few of them have got churches mentioned and I'm, all, I'm also a bell ringer now that I've grown up and so churches and churchyards, quite a few yeah. people said to me, another church I see, there's a church <laughs> in there and, and but the churches are named after churches that I know so that's, I do that a lot, I, I add things in and people's names are family names going back in history because it it's I just want to pop in yeah um, and in this in this book here my my great grandmother she hasn't got a gravestone so I've given her a gravestone she's finally got one in my book so I popped her in <laughs> and I put it in nice. the acknowledgements and everyone keeps going oh she's finally got a gravestone so yeah those little things I just that's pop lovely in. that you can yeah. just weave in your life into these books that yeah, are published and sold around it. the world yeah that's lovely and that's it yeah so that's what I do. Yeah. Um, so are you are you sort of going book by book? Do you have a do you have how many books do you plan in advance? Um, do you uh, wait for inspiration? No, I don't wait for inspiration. I don't have to wait for inspiration. I find inspiration everywhere. I, I meet somebody and I think, oh, oh right. yeah. so I've got an ideas book that I jot things down. Yeah. Um, and some ideas in that book have been there for years. Um, from Shetland with Love starts on an allotment plot and I had the idea of an allotment plot based location for about 15 years oh, okay. but it was never the right place to use and then when I, when I said I, I wanted to write Shetland they said have you got a unique spot and I said yeah an allotment plot so that's, so that's yeah. how this start, so starts off a young lady is, is trying to overcome some difficulties and um, her grandfather signs her up for an allotment plot and she takes it on. Um, she wants to give it up quite soon, but it, she takes it on and uh, she sticks with it. But there's a whole world of characters and then it expands from that and grows and that's how the Shetland books start. Um, do I plan in advance? Yes, I am, I am a planner, as you've seen. Um, for some authors... Their publishing group yeah. asked them to write a specific thing. Oh, so okay. could you could you write about a cafe? Could you write about oh, a hotel? Okay. Um, 
I feel very lucky yeah. that my publishing group say, what do you want to write? They give you free reign to... Complete free reign. That's brilliant. Um, so then I, I, I pitch ideas, but so far they haven't rejected one. So I've been very yes, so touch well. wood, <laughs> touch wood. That's worked out nicely for me. And contracts seem to be in twos or fours. Yeah. So you you always have two ideas, or you pitch four ideas. Um, and so far, it's gone it's gone well for me. I've always Brilliant. I've always had ideas, and I just keep going back to my little book, and then you just put things together and put things yeah. together. And so I've always got ideas. I get ideas all over the place. So yeah, it sounds like you've had a really um, lovely experience with the publishing industry and, yes. and your agent and that yeah, sort yeah. of thing. Would you recommend that as a route? Versus... I, I would because it was my dream. It was yeah. my dream to have a traditional publisher and to have an agent. Um, I know lots of people do self-publishing yeah. because they want their, their they want full control because you you have full control when you do self-publishing. Yeah, I. I just want to, I want to write the book. I want to write the story. Yeah. And I don't want to be, um, I, want, I don't want to be thinking about the, the front cover. Advertising. I mean, and like well, I, yeah. I do a lot of advertising. I must oh, admit, really? I, I do a lot of advertising on social media. So I do, I think a lot of authors do that. Yeah. But the actual nitty gritty of from page to book, yeah. I, let, I let the experts do that. They it do must ask. Be nice to have the professionals, teams of people oh, to just take care of everything. Yeah. And, Make yeah. it look fancy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they do. They do say to you, "Do you like the cover? Do you want to change it? Is there anything you don't like? Is there anything you don't want? Are you happy with the colours?" And and I always am quite open minded, and and say, "Well, like for instance, I, I know I remember that this book came through, and she was in green." And I said to her, in the book, she's not in a green coat; she's in a red coat. Can we have that changed? And they changed it within. And it's only a tiny little detail, but to me. It mattered, um, and in the Shetland book, there was um, there's a lady that grows delphiniums. She doesn't grow veg vegetables on her on her allotment plot. She grows delphiniums. She grows something beautiful, and they had tulips down the bottom. Yeah. And I said, "Why have you got tulips when blue delphiniums is what is what she grows?" So they they just change it, but it comes down to choosing what you want to spend your time on, yeah. and. But no, I'm happy. I'm happy with how, how, yes. Yeah, Obviously, it's worked out really well. Yeah, it has. I saw yeah. you said on Twitter you've published, like mm. published like a million words now. Yeah, yeah. There's fantastic. A, there's a million words there. I, I keep thinking, I'd love to know what the millionth word is. <laughs> yeah. I really hope it's not a the or an a or a <laughs> if. I want it to be something like paraphernalia or something. You know what I mean? I want yeah. it something beautiful, but... It probably isn't, is it, really? <laughs> <laughs> so I can't imagine looking at your covers that these are unhappy books. No, no, they're not. No, they're there are. But are they the sort of books that, you know, you want to know what the ending is? Yeah. Rather hmm. than just a narrative of ordinary people. But um, do you want to know how yeah. yeah. it's Yeah. They're page turners. Yeah. They're the kind of books... Um, a friend of a friend, his, his wife said, I'm just going to have a little read. And she started off in bed reading. And um, on the evening when he got home from work, he said, have you done anything? Nothing's changed in the house. Nothing. Not a single thing has changed in the house. She said, no. But I finished it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done anything, but I finished it. Um, yeah, they are. Because I think, I think what happened, just like Jane Austen's, I think you almost are cheerleading for certain people. You, you can see the situation. So if I take this book, this is my latest one. <laughs> We've got the beautiful cottage that everyone met in the previous book. And for Christmas, it's been rented by the Carmichaels. Now, the Carmichaels are a blended family, like no other, which, which we're using. Um, Mr. Carmichael is just about to get married for the fifth time. And he's brought together, because they're a blended family and they all get on, <laughs> honest. <laughs> he's brought together his four children by four different women and the four women and the cook who has been with him for 30 years. And she's, she's the only sensible one that's never married him, whereas all the others have come and gone. And 
So the three women are Lowry, because I, I love Ellis Lowry's work. He, he, he painted just ordinary people and made it extraordinary. And so I've called one of my girls Lowry. So Lowry is the daughter of the bride-to-be. So Lowry has turned up for Christmas in this cottage, hoping that her mum is going to have the wedding of a lifetime, but she's yet to meet the family. You have Helen, who is the first ex-wife. And of course, she's been there for 30 years, and she's seen all the babies born, and she's seen all the wives come and go, and she's seen all the order of service, and she's heard all his vows. And she don't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got Martha. Now, Martha is the housekeeper. She's cooked every meal for 30 years. She's made every christening cake. She's baked every wedding cake. And those are the three voices. And so all the family are together in this large cottage and Christmas is happening, a wedding's happening, and a birthday's happening. And you've got the women intermingling. And of course, Helen and Martha have known each other and relied on each other for 30 years whilst dealing with this man who has had all these different wives. And then you've got young Larry who really wants the most best for her mom. And then all of a sudden, the children are coming forward and there's different relationships and things. It's getting complicated. And as a reader, you're meeting each of the people. So you're probably getting complicated as well. And then all of a sudden, it, it sits and it works out and you understand who's who. But that's, that's my latest book. So yeah, so... You root for certain people that you want certain things to happen and you want them to have their happy ever after. But you know that, well, life isn't like that, is it? You sometimes don't get a happy ever after and there's lots of obstacles. And so I think with my books, you kind of latch on to a person and you, you want them to have the, end, the right ending for them is what you want. You very so. quickly... Um like the characters in your books i've noticed like mm. you're good at within like chapter one you're already liking them you're rooting for them yeah um you know some characters in other books can be a bit of a slow burn yeah um, but because you jump around people's heads very quickly you, you yeah. very quickly get to know and like them yeah um, i think they're very different as well aren't they i yeah. don't i don't tend to pick um kind of flat characters yeah the contrast between the three women is always yeah really good and yeah. really interesting well, that way, so you can kind of hang different qualities on. Yeah. So, so in, in New Beginnings at Rose Cottage, we've got Benny, and she is overweight. And so she, she can't walk around Brixham. She can't do what Emma's doing. And she wants to do certain things, and she knows that she's got these obstacles and she's got to overcome them. And so that's what that happens. And she admits she's not living. She's really not living. She's just existing. And so that's what happens in New Beginnings. But she's coupled up with Ruth, who feels so guilty about taking a holiday, having cared for her mom 24 hours a day for years and years and years. But she deserves a holiday. And then you've got Emma, who... Um, Emma's got a bit of a secret going on, but she's had a large lump of money. She's had this sum of money... And she wants to do something exciting because she wants to restart her life and have a fresh start. And um, she's kind of missed out in the past. And I think she's almost going just a little bit too fast for what she should be doing. And, and that, they come together, you say. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we might have to wrap up shortly. I was no just problem. going to ask, as, as you were a secret writer yourself for a very long time, um, and it sounds like you just sort of learned by doing it for mm. years and years and years. Do you have any advice for people who would like to have a go themselves? Um, you know, I think... Writing novels and... For me, I write every day. I know, I know some authors don't write every day. But for me, once I've got the thread of a story, it's best to write a little bit today. Yeah. Even if it's half an hour, to keep that thread going. Because if I have three days off... I then have to go back and hold the thread and pull it through, the thread of the story. And if I let go of it, I lose the story. I lose where I am. So I, I do write every day. 
So Monday to Friday is very yeah. much kind of office hours. Saturdays I only do an hour, and on Sundays I do a couple of hours. Um, but this is what started me off, and this is back from 1994, and I've still got it, still works. Um, it works with homework. Put 30 minutes on the clock, and you can stop when that finishes. And that is how I started writing, started finding my time to write, because I was juggling with a full-time job, and I kept thinking, I've got to do that, I've got to do that, I've got to do that, but I want to write. And, of yeah. course, writing would wait till tomorrow. And then the next day, I want, I've got that and that and that, but I really want to write. And in the end, I just thought, I'm doing it. So 30 minutes on the clock. Please leave me alone, everybody. I'm only having 30 minutes. But yeah. at the end of the week, you've got three and a half week, three and a half hours written. And I still sometimes use this clock. I think I'll go and do half an hour. And if I'm engrossed, I just keep going. And if I want to get up after 30 minutes, then I do. So yeah. that would be my advice, is Brilliant. to find a pattern that works for you and, and, and some discipline, as in time-wise. Yeah. But at the end of each week, I knew how much I'd written time-wise, and it just carries on from there. That's Brilliant. it. Oh, that's, that's what great. I do. Thank you. No problem. Um, does anybody else have any last questions? Oh, yeah. Um, when you say you read really half the book, you read half the book, you read half the book, how do you do that? Do you just bring up on the computer and start? I think because I have I have played with a few and, and mm. to look at what I've got to do they are all on computer which I'm very lucky mm. that they're there on computer um, I think what I've got to do is I've got the original draft I think I've got to start a brand new draft yeah, and then it. and cut and paste the good bits yeah. so I think what I've got to do is write it that's a good bit so I'd read chapter one know where the story is in the head, write how I would write it now, but that was a good description, that was a good conversation, that was a good observation, in it goes, ch -ch -ch -ch. chapter one done, let's go to chapter two. I think that's what I've got to do. Somebody has told me that rewriting the book is actually yeah. worse and harder than actually blank page, because it's just got to flow. Um, I think that's how I'm going to work it and do. But I have got to rehash them because they're just, they're just too flat. They're just too flat as they are. And I've learned so much in doing, I've got to put the, the, life. Yeah, the life back into them kind of thing. So, yeah, I think that's how I'm going to do it. Yeah, best of luck, got four. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that's probably going to be the equivalent of writing about eight books yeah, okay. in my head. In my head, I've got like double. Yeah, oh, in my head, I'm thinking I could write eight books in that time. But it's probably worse for you because you're a fan. I'm thinking if somebody writes a messy book, oh yeah, they can just treat yeah, it yeah. as a messy book. Yeah. Oh yeah, gosh, can you can you imagine me and write post-it notes? <laughs> now that's going to be that's going to be a shocker. <laughs> well, when did you start going into Side. You mentioned you had an agent. Was that how, did that start you getting that way? Or? Um, I had an agent. I had an agent through Katie Ford. In back in 2017, Katie Ford always gives a bursary each year. And for 2017, she chose myself and a lady called Donna Ashcroft, and we were her bursary twins for That's 2017. Um, I very quickly finished off this book my debut book, because I was right at the very end. Um, and I wanted to be ready for when, when the ceremony happened. And I'd been getting lots and lots of rejections over those 23 years. I didn't want to be published at the beginning, but definitely the last, probably six or seven of those, the last six or seven of those 23, I did want to be published. So I'd sent work out and got rejected. And then Katie for game anniversary. And I then went on the writing retreat and an agent, um, girl on a train. Oh, the oh, yeah. Hawkins. Well, her agent, Lizzie Kramer, was at a writing retreat, and she heard me talking to Rowan Coleman about this book, and she was earwigging, and uh, I left the room, and, and, and Rowan, Rowan said something that she would do to improve this book, because she'd read the first little bit. And I left the room, and Lizzie Kramer came after me, and said, I know someone who's looking for a Christmas book. 
Um, and I said, oh, it's, it's not, a, this is what I said at the time, so naive, oh, it's not a Christmas book, it's a New Year book. And she looked at me and she said, hmm? and I said, oh, but I could change it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I could change it. And it did. So I, I moved this book. This was originally New Year's Eve oh, um, nice. and it got changed to Christmas Eve. And it took me seven days to bring the whole book forward. And, uh, and the editor, she passed me a, a, a phone, a, an email address. And the editor bought this one plus the other two. And that was Aria. That was Aria Publishers. So I was with those first. And then I moved to Headline. Um, I think the lady asked at the beginning, did Headline come to me? Um, David, when, when you're looking for a publisher, you have dinners and drinks and you kind of go around and meet different people. And it wasn't clicking. I, I was thinking, oh, I don't think I could work with that person. I don't think I could work yeah. with that, that publisher. And, um, and Headline phoned David and said, are you bringing Erin Green to see us? And he said, I wasn't. And they said, we'd like to see her, please. <laughs> so, so they had heard that I'd be, because in this industry, everybody talks to everybody. And other people had said, oh, we met Erin Green. And um, Headline were waiting, but he, he didn't approach them. So they approached him and... That was the cup of tea I went for, and she phoned him back, and Brilliant. and I've been with them since, and I've done, um, yeah, I've done nine other books with Headline, so uh, so yeah, that's how it worked. Did you get your first contract before you got with your agent? The day before. <laughs> the day before, how I got my how I got my agent was Katie Ford to give me the bursary. Um, the lady at Aria had offered me a three book deal and it was frightening because you've waited so long for this contract to come through yeah and then it's there on the screen and you've just got to sign your name but you don't understand the numbers you don't understand the percentages you don't understand the legal terms and like it's like 13 pages long then you think nice. there's a dotted line i want to sign but do i and uh, i contacted katie ford and said now what do i do you know <laughs> I, I don't know what to do and she said uh I, I, I know someone who's, who's, who's going to help you out. So I contacted David and, uh, and I sent the contract to him and he had a look at it and, and worked it from there. So I got my Brilliant. contract one day and I got my agent the next day. And so far, it's gone lovely. What a week that was. <laughs> it was a week. Thank yes, you. it was a week. Um, can I ask you about the, quickly about the Romantic Novelists Association as well? Because yeah. yourself and the, the two authors who are coming soon are all members of the Romantic Novelists yeah. Association. Um, so could you talk a little bit just about what benefit you get from that and okay. how you... Um, um, so imagine that I'm in my, in my bedroom still as a secret author, secret writer, and I'd never met another author live in my life. I'd never met another author. And I thought I need to start meeting and greeting and, and understanding and learning, learning from other authors. And so I joined the Romantic novelist association and i joined their new writer scheme and that meant that i was entitled to write my manuscript send it off and an author would read it and give me back a report that's and, amazing and this is the book this is the one that this is it yeah this, this, it worked. yeah it worked it worked um when i sent off my manuscript for this the my reader came back and said lovely book Fantastic story. Um, I think you're going to get this published. It's just a matter of time. Uh, there was a few things, grammatical errors and things that had to be changed, but it was a New Year Eve story. Um, and then that's how I met Katie Ford. Yeah. And Katie had seen me going to the events. Oh, and by and by talking, she'd learned that I was, I was teaching. So I'd jump on the half three train, go down to London, go across London, go to a party and be back on the 10 o'clock train from right. London. And then the next day I would get up and, and teach, <laughs> and teach all day. And Katie and, and other, other people, I call them my, fa my fairy godmothers now. Um, my other fairy godmothers were like, wow, that's just amazing that you're doing that. And I said, but I want to be published. And so Katie chose me and Donna. And yeah, 21 days after that, I had my contract next day after that i had david as my agent Brilliant. and it's just started from there so but that's a good way to sort of get it's get a, in with other people get advice and feedback absolutely and get yourself just in front of people who are doing the same yeah. thing as you and to learn from 
to learn to, you know I, I would say to somebody don't keep editing chapter one right write chapter two chapter three chapter four get the whole book written and then go back and edit but yeah. I only knew that because other people have said to me, "Stop, stop writing chapter one. Right. Just leave it. Just move along, move along the, the the chapters and write." And that's what I did. And and yeah, it, it's worked. It's and it's it good to get advice from other authors that have been on your journey, same yeah. journey. So yeah, it's it easy giving up a proper job. Um, was it easy giving a proper job? Um, no, there was a lot. You know, it's difficult. I think. Um, yes, and it, well, it, it's a it's a leap of faith because the thing is, I, I ended up doing two full time jobs because I was teaching all day yeah. and then of an evening coming home, and, and like I said, that took one hundred and seven days. I didn't do anything else in those one hundred and seven days. I didn't watch telly or watch a film or or live another life. So to be honest, you get to a point where you, it's almost that tipping point of, yeah. what am I going to do? Is it teaching? Or writing and I'll, I'll be totally honest I went down to four days a week with teaching then I went down to three days a week with teaching in order to balance it and then it became January 2020 and I heard about this virus right. on the other side of the yeah. world and so I said to the agency that I was working with I'm gonna take a month off I'm gonna see if I can cope at home as an author but straight away I could write double the amount than I was doing because I was home all day. And so um, I never went back. So my last day in a classroom was the 29th of January, 2020. And then that COVID yeah. thing happened and I just carried on writing and writing. So it wor it's worked for me. The decision I feel, touch wood, was almost taken out of my hands by, by what happened yeah. and Katie Ford helped unlock that final lock for me because I've got lots of rejections of, and they're lovely rejections, yeah. lovely book, but we've just signed someone that's done something similar. Right. That can't be helped. So, so yeah, I miss the children. I miss the children terribly because, because when you're a teacher, you, you, you do, you know, you do take some of them to your heart. Yeah. Um, but I've got my classroom clock on my office wall. And I do at eleven. It's funny. Eleven o'clock always seems to be break time. And if break time, I think oh, it's eleven o'clock. <laughs> kids will be on the playground now. Oh, it's raining. Oh no. <laughs> so yeah, it's always the way. It always rained on my break duty. So I do miss the children. I don't miss the loopholes. Don't miss all those other demands that teachers have. It's the razzmatazz, as I used to call it. I don't miss that. But I do miss the children because they they do. Yeah, they used to make me laugh. They were they were great. So yeah. It seems exactly. that's come up quite a lot. We've done um, four or five author talks before, yeah. and um, COVID has come up a lot. Yeah. Where where it's obviously this horrendous, mm. traumatic, awful mm. thing, um, mm. but it's given a lot of people a chance to rethink and yeah. start doing the thing that they love. It's, it's like pressing that reset button, isn't it? And yeah. you think, well, am I going go back to what I was doing, or is it a press the button? Yeah. And and I can always go back to teaching. You know, my qualifications, yeah. they're never going to say no to an English teacher, are they? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, choose, I chose fairly the right safe. subject. Yeah, so I'm fairly <laughs> safe on that one, aren't I? So uh, they're never going to say no, thank you. Even yeah. if I had to do some retraining, they're never going to say no to an English teacher. Especially not a, no. a published novelist. Oh, yeah, that's, that's it. So, that's amazing. So, yeah, that's where I am. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming in. It's, it's a been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, did you want to do something with... Right, cards. so let me go and do, before everybody goes, let me just grab these other cards that are lying around, only so that I can know numbers, she says. No, have you got a card? You've got one? Right, so if you uh, look at your card, you've got a number where the stamp should be, please don't tell me. I'm going to choose number nine that's you, that's you. There you go. Oh, wow. right have you got your copy of your book yes you've got yours haven't you oh i think that's it um here it is <laughs> there you go i'm going to sign that for you so you can take that home with you today so that so you can read it's a complete standalone you can meet the family 
and you'll be meeting the cottage and then you can do well there you go well see we've changed your look there so there you go so i shall sign that to you please don't leave without it <laughs> yeah. So I shall sign that to you. Brilliant. But thank you very much. No, it's a pleasure. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Thank you. I shall linger around a little bit afterwards if anyone has any questions. I'm Brilliant. going to sign that lady's book over there. I shall sign them for you. I'll have to run off and do some real work That's in a minute. Absolutely but fine. This room is free, so feel yeah. free to hang out and have some more tea and coffee yeah. and. And yet, take your book and put it out. Yeah, thank put you it very out much. I'll add the... it to our catalogue. No, no problem at all. Oh, it's, let me just take this.